Here we are on our map covering autonomic pharmacology. The uh, last thing that, whoa, wait a minute, time out. The last thing that we talked about were, were the uh, beta agonists. And um, today we're going to uh, go back up here and we're going to be talking about the alpha agonists. Those are drugs that act as a, uh, stimulators at alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors. So let's see if I can carry on with this. Right. So alpha-1 agonists are in widespread use. A lot of the over-the-counter products, mostly you see them as uh, nasal decongestants is probably their most common use. And uh, as over-the-counter diet aids, that used to be a bigger market than it is today, uh, but it, it's still out there. And as a group, alpha agonists are characterized by tachyphylaxis, which means the rapid development of tolerance. And here just are some of the examples, names of the drugs that you may have seen on over-the-counter products, such as pseudofedrin and phenylephrine, and formerly a drug called phenylpropanolamine or PPA um, that has been taken off the shelves in uh, pharmacies. Pharmacists were asked to do uh, voluntary removal of these products from their shelves and pharmacists complied. It turned out that there were some cardiovascular risk associated with the use of phenylpropanolamine. We'll talk more about that later. It's abbreviated as PPA if you ever see that in the literature. It's still available uh, in veterinary uh, pharmacy for the treatment of canine incontinence, meaning the dog pees a lot. Uh, you'll also see the, uh, and we've talked some about the product uh, or the compound oxymetazoline, and it's uh, an active ingredient in the uh, nose sprays that are advertised as being long acting or 12 hour nose sprays. For example, Afrin. Afrin, A-F-R-I-N, is a product, has a, uh, or has had at least a regular form that's fairly short acting and then a long acting form. The long acting form contains the drug oxymetazoline, right, which lasts up to 12 hours. And the reason it lasts is because it's resistant to destruction by the enzymes monoamine oxidase and catechol O methyl transferase. Just want to keep these uh, enzyme names in front of you because they'll be important all the way through. Well, there we go. So these are some uh, formerly prescription uh, alpha agonists uh, that are not currently in use in the United States. Uh, the first one is methoxamine and when it was used its brand name was Vasoxyl. Uh, as I said, it's not currently used in the United States. But as an alpha-1 agonist, it had the predominant property of being a vasoconstrictor. Remember that alpha-1 receptors are on the blood vessels, and when the alpha-1 receptors are stimulated, they cause vasoconstriction. And these were used to treat hypotensive states, and that is where a patient's uh, blood pressure is too low. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that with the next drug, right? But they're used to treat low blood pressure. Uh, the second drug is uh, mefentermine, mef I'm sorry, mefentermine, which also is not in clinical use. It used to be. It has direct and indirect acting drugs. And by direct, I mean that it acted as an agonist at the alpha-1 receptor but it also has indirect actions in that it causes norepinephrine to be released from nerve terminal. And that means that it's going to have alpha effects. The direct effects are alpha, and the indirect effects are alpha and beta effects. So it's a cardiac stimulant as well as a vasoconstriction. Remember that beta receptors are, especially the beta 1 receptors on the heart, cause the heart to. Uh, beat faster and harder. Uh, it was used to treat hypotension. It was also used as a cardiac stimulant. It's an abusable drug. Uh, it's addictive, and I demonstrate that by comparing its structure. This is the 
the Fentermine uh, structure right here compared to the structure for methamphetamine right here. And you, you can see the only difference is the addition of a methyl group right there on that carbon. Um, and both of these drugs might, had been used as uh, in the treatment of hypotension or low blood pressure, which is a problem in the use of general anesthetics, especially in the older population where a patient gets put under general anesthesia for surgery and during that general anesthesia, their blood pressure uh, drops very low. And that's been associated with a condition called POCD, not to be confused with COPD, same letters, just different order, where POCD stands for post-operative cognitive dysfunction, which is uh, particularly a problem uh, in older patient populations. All right, so here's uh, two other drugs. The, and, and the reason, I, you know, so why am I mentioning this drugs that aren't in use uh, on this previous page, methoxamine and mefentermine, you know, currently not available? Well, these uh, may be available not legally, right? So they're not in clinical use, but you may see this uh, uh, as a, uh, mefentermine, particularly as a cardiac stimulant, a performance enhancer. It really makes people feel hyped up, kind of like meth does. And it's um, used in illegally or has been used illegally in some athletic performance. So you and and these drugs tend to make a comeback um, just because they've been discontinued for current use. Some Future use may be discovered for these drugs and they may be reintroduced into the market, so I wanted you to be aware of them. Right, a couple more, metaraminol or aramine, right, which has also been discontinued, but this one had uh, an interesting use. And like the other, it's uh, also direct acting alpha agonist and indirect acting as well. Indirect acting means that it acts on the uh, synapse at the presynaptic neuron to cause norepinephrine release. And it's a vaso vasoconstrictive agent, so it's again used to treat uh, hypertensive states. But originally, uh, before it was discontinued, it was used to treat a condition called paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Now let's break that term down a little bit. Paroxys paroxysmal means sudden onset and not particularly uh, predictable, right? So a paroxysmal is a sudden onset, supraventricular, that means at a site above the ventricles in the heart. So this would be somewhere above the ventricles, probably in the atria, SA node, and tachycardia is a rapid heart rate. So this is a rapid heart rate that comes from some origin, probably in the atria, and is a sudden onset. So I asked the question of why would an alpha agonist slow heart rate? So think for a moment about that. Why would an alpha agonist, something that was vasoconstrictive, act as something that slowed the heart rate? And we saw this previously in the dog studies where we looked at the three cardiac tracings uh, for phenylephrine, for epinephrine, and isoproterenol. And phenylephrine was the top tracing. And as you will recall, that one raised blood pressure through vasoconstrictive mechanisms, and there was a reflex bradycardia. So the heart slowed down because the vasoconstrictive effects raised blood pressure, right? So this increases blood pressure. Right, and that sets off the barrel receptors. Right, and that leads to uh, a reflex decrease in heart rate. Right, and uh, I just thought that was a clever mechanism uh, for treating this particular condition. So the next drug on the list is still in use. It's not in widespread use, but it's still available. Midodrine or proamatine, 
right? And that's a, a brand name. There may be other brand names as well. It is a drug. Uh, it's metabolized to desglymidrine. And this des means something got removed. And gly is uh, a glycine uh, amino acid that was attached to the midodrine. And metabolism takes that off and you're left with the active compound known as desglymidodrine. Uh, right? And so I'm just going to keep this concept of pro drug active. And it's used for the treatment of autonomic insufficiency. That means uh, patients, particularly older patients, will lose control of their autonomic nervous system and their sympathetic nervous system won't uh, react appropriately. And this becomes evident in a condition called postural hypotension, also known as orthostatic hypotension. Last year's students, unusually, had already been introduced to this concept by the time they got to this point in the curriculum. Uh, I don't know whether or not you have. Uh, so let me explain orthostatic or postural hypotension. These, this term, postural hypotension and orthostatic hypotension, are synonyms of one another. And this is the condition where, uh, and it happens to all of us, is that when you're lying down, right, your blood tends to pool, your heart doesn't have to pump very hard, uh, and your blood vessels relax because everything in your body is on the same level, right? You're in the horizontal position, and so it's pretty easy for your blood to pump you know, essentially straight across your body rather than up and down, and especially to your brain, right? So there's no uphill pumping of blood from your heart to your brain. Your head is down at the same level as your heart. And so you tend to get vasodilation, right? Because um, you don't need very much tension in the vasculature leading to the brain to keep the blood flow going. Uh, you, you, you can operate well with a low blood pressure condition when you're lying down. Well, then you suddenly stand up, and it is the sympathetic nervous system that detects within a fraction of a second, the sympathetic nervous system detects the fact that you have stood up and the blood flow to your brain is not what it was when you were lying down. And so you have a reflex response that both increases cardiac output and causes vasoconstriction to keep the blood pressure up, to keep blood flowing to your brain. You get an increase in blood pressure all over your body, and uh, it keeps the, the, the vasoconstriction throughout your body, keeps the blood essentially from falling down to your feet. And uh, <clears throat> so the v blood vessels constrict, and that increases venous return to your heart, and that increases cardiac output, and that increases blood flow to your brain. And that's what happens normally. It happens within a fraction of a second. And if that doesn't happen, your body has automatic mechanisms to make you lie back down. And I'm sure that everyone has experienced that phenomenon of, uh, oh, I stood up too fast. Right? You stand up and it's like, whoa, you're kind of dizzy and, and feel faint even for just briefly. And the older patient population, this can be a profound problem where people have autonomic insufficiency. Their bodies don't undergo this reflex response very, very ably. And so they tend to faint when they stand up, right? And then they fall down. Uh, and it's a, a serious condition and a drug that acts as an alpha agonist that's stimulating the alpha receptors on the blood vessels is going to cause vasoconstriction and it's going to counteract the effects of this autonomic insufficiency. It'll counteract the effects of this postural or orthostatic hypotension. And midodrine is a orally administered uh, by tablet uh, drug that, that is used to treat that condition. But metaraminol could do the same thing, and the drugs on the previous slide could have done the same thing. It's just that this one looks like it's uh, one of the safer drugs. And so, it, and there's not a huge market for this, and these drugs are all off patent, and so, uh, you know, the market has kind of dwindled. But it's still out there, and you'll see it used, and you need to know what orthostatic hypotension is. All right, as long as we're talking about alpha agonists, 
we've already talked about injectable norepinephrine being used in uh, emergency cardiovascular problems uh, and uh, just including it again just to emphasize that norepinephrine is a drug in and of itself the brand name is levofed there are probably other brand names it's inject injectable only and you should know why it's only available for injection and that's because if you took it orally um, it's going to be destroyed by the uh, COMT, the catecholomethyltransferase that's in the lining of the intestine and the monoamine oxidase that's in the liver. So it would not be appreciably absorbed. And you couldn't take it uh, transdermally or any other way because it's not going to cross the membrane barriers very well because it's so water soluble. But it is used in the uh, treatment of a severe acute hypotension and which we often see in shock states where shock is again just a, uh, a general term that means that blood pressure has fallen below a level that's compatible with, contain, with, with continued life right so it's a life-threatening low blood pressure and you see shock conditions like an hypovolemic shock that means that your blood volume has been reduced you know maybe you've been in an accident uh, you know you've been cut in some way gunshot would be another way to do it and you uh, are losing a lot of blood volume and there at some point your cardiovascular system can no longer maintain blood pressure but just because there's not enough blood there uh, and that would be a, a hemorrhagic shock uh, there's a neurogenic shock that occurs when uh, you're just uh, your nervous system has been subjected to some uh, violent trauma in some way um, you know falling off a ladder or being in a car wreck or something like that may cause a, a neurogenic shock and then there's septic shock which is due to a, 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 an infection that is in the bloodstream and some of the toxins released by bacteria in the bloodstream cause uh, essentially cardiovascular collapse and blood pressure drops to a dangerous low level so know what shock is Alpha agonists have been used uh, almost comically uh, and to some extent, a wide extent in the past, in uh, weight reduction. Uh, and the drugs that do this are all centrally acting drugs, and that means they all cross the blood brain barrier and they're all sympathomimetics. Right? So they're stimulating uh, the same neurotrans, using the same neurotransmitter system and receptor system that the sympathetic nervous system uses. So we call these centrally acting sympathomimetics. And they're not necessarily alpha agonists, but they generally have a strong alpha agonist type property. Uh, and they use uh, all, all forms of amphetamine, methamphetamine, dexamphetamine, as a prodrug for benzamphetamine. Uh, and I, if I'm not mistaken, Adderall is in this class right here. Um, and those these drugs do have effects on uh, body weight right but it's not uh, they're not without their side effects uh, so be aware of that the uh, uh fentramine is another one that was in a product that's known as fasten it's fentramine has also been used in combination with a drug called topiramate that dr pond will talk to you about and the product is kizima kizima right and that is a drug this this kizma is uh, used uh, on a long term basis for uh, weight loss. Uh, I shudder to think at at going on a drug like this for a long term because I think there are going to be deleterious effects on the central nervous system with cognitive uh, disruption, uh, memory loss, impaired thinking, and so forth. Uh, but people will do it because uh, weight loss is a highly desirable thing. And fentramine, fentramine was previously used in a drug combination called Fentan. And I want to tell you the story about this, and I didn't put any notes about it because I don't want you to worry about having to remember this. But I feel like it would be remiss if I didn't do the, the Fentan story. So the Fentan was, and I think I've actually misspelled it, I think it was the F first, Fen, Fen. And I did not intentionally put that horizontal line right there. Wonderful. Yep. 
thin, thin, thin. Okay, and this was a combination of uh, a drug called the thin was a drug called fenfluramine. Fenfluramine. Well, let's just wrap on around here. Fenfluramine. And this is uh, a serotonin active drug. I mean, it probably inhibits serotonin reuptake and causes serotonin to spill into the synapses that stimulate serotonin release. So that drug by itself had modest effects on weight loss. And then when combined with fentermine right here, this drug, right, it caused a fairly profound uh, weight loss. So this was a marketing triumph for the company that produced it. And after, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people uh, got put on this drug, it came out and became evident that in a certain portion of the population, it caused pulmonary hypertension, which is considered to be a fairly unusual disorder. It does happen. You'll probably see it in the hospital at some point. Um, pulmonary hypertension and cardiac valve defects, uh, which were life-threatening, and some patients died, and so it got jerked from the market. So the company that was manufacturing this had a multi-billion dollar selling drug, and um, it, it didn't make it, and they ended up getting uh, their pants sued off before because of it. So that's uh, just kind of the thin, thin story. There have been other drugs that did But the fentermine is now combined. Uh, the, the idea that you could combine fentermine with another drug to produce um, a relatively safe long-term weight loss is a compelling thing. And so now we have this product, this Quizma. Right, which is a combination of topiramate and fentermine together. Other drugs in this class, uh, fendimetrazine has been tried. Uh, fenmetrazine is another one. Diethylpropion. These are just the names of some drugs that are considered centrally acting sympathomimetics that have been used in, for weight loss. There, this drug, uh, phenylpropanolamine, which I uh, mentioned previously, is the one used still to treat urinary incontinence in dogs, uh, was a popular over-the-counter drug. Uh, on, in, in the 70s, this, uh, there was a product on the shelves, and it had the unfortunate name of AIDS. Um, and the advent of AIDS, as we know it today, acquired immune deficiency um, uh, being so unappealing that it, it essentially killed this drug and then pharmacists were asked to take this drug PPA off the market uh, off their shelves and they did so I thought that was a interesting little story about the death of uh, phenylpropanolamine and its relationship to weight loss Right. I just wanted to mention this other, the, this, I find this interesting because of its mechanism of action uh, tried in the past uh, and another failure for weight loss. And the pharmacology is littered with weight loss failures. Uh, this compound called 2,4-dinitrophenol, and you can just about visualize that name. You've got a phenyl ring with nitro groups at the 2 and 4 position. Uh, abbreviated as DNP, right, 2,4-dinitrophenol, was tried for weight loss and it worked and it was really uh, successful. Its mechanism of action is that DNP uncouples oxidative phosphorylation, which sounds dangerous because uh, if you really strongly uncouple oxidative phosphorylation, you'll die. This is the process of uh, where electrons are transported down the electron transport chain in the mitochondria and ATP is produced. All right, so uh, what dinitrophenol does is that, that it, it disrupts the proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane that's necessary for uh, driving ATP synthase. I'm sure you remember this from biochemistry. 
but uh, it uncouple it breaks down that proton gradient and so you still get uh, electrons flowing down the electron transport uh, chain but instead of being able to produce ATP you get heat right so you get heat production instead of ATP production and so your batteries are going into gener the generation of heat rather than in the synthesis of ATP and this heat production because you've disrupted the proton gradient is uh, uh, not necessarily a regulated process and it was controlled by the dosage right and you, you get you kept the dose low enough so that it didn't kill patients and didn't generate too much heat and it turns out <clears throat> this is one of my main reasons for mentioning this story and I've, I've alluded to these previously but in the mitochondria at certain times there are uh, proteins that are produced that are called uncoupling proteins or UCPs and they do the same thing naturally these uncoupling protons uh, proteins disrupt the uh, proton gradient across the mitochondrial membrane and cause you to generate heat instead of ATP and you you start burning off a lot of calories that way and um, I mentioned this because the regulation of these uncoupling proteins might be a more efficient and safer way to regulate uh, uh, weight loss, right? So you're burning your calories just to generate more heat, more body heat. And you don't have to generate like a whole lot more body heat, but if you raise your body temperature by, um, you know, a half a degree, that would account for a lot of calories every day. Um, what happened to DMP as a drug? It turned out that it caused cataracts by some unknown toxic mechanism, and so that killed this. Anyway, be watching on the future horizon for drugs that affect uncoupling proteins. I think that's going to be a, a drug target. So, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, end the lecture here because the next thing that we're going to get into is alpha-2 agonists. And the drugs that we just talked about are predominantly alpha-1 agonists. Well, alpha-2 agonist stimulation is such a different kettle of fish. It's such a different thing that it, um, it deserves a break. So I'm going to take one here and call this the end of Tuesday's lecture and hope y'all are doing well out there. And if I can figure out what happened to my integrity thing <laughs> and how to get out of this, <laughs> I'll do it. I'm swiping left and right and up and down, and there it went. No, I don't want to keep those animations. All right. Hope y'all are doing well.